Amen. Could you open your Bibles to the historical book of Judges? Judges chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 1 through 11, verse 29 through 31, and then the verse 34. The same text preached at 815. Judges chapter 11, verse 1 through 11, verse 29 and 31, in verse 34. That's Old Testament book, historical book. Judges as follows the book of Joshua. If you have arrived there, say amen. amen. If you're still looking to find it, just say wait. Mm -hmm. Keep on driving, you're going to get there. But if you pass Psalms and you're going into the New Testament, you just got lost. Just go back in reverse. Go up to the front of the Bible. Work your way through. And all y'all need to know the 66 books of the Bible in order. Amen. That's your heritage right there too. Judges chapter 11, verse 1 through 11, 29 to 31, and verse 34. If you arrive there, say Amen. Reading from the rustic language of the King James, and it reads thusly. Now Jephthah the Gilead, or the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah. And said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And they were gathered vain men of Jephthah and went out with him. And it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Amnon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Amnon made war against Israel, the elders of Gildad, or Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said unto, him, unto Jephthah, Come and be our captain and we might fight with the children of Amnon. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now when ye are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Amnon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Amnon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Now turn to verse 29. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, passed over Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Amnon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Amnon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Amnon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Verse 34, And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and dances, and she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of our God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Tag teaming with Gary Sampson, I want to preach from the same subject. The day your fence became my cage. The day your fence became my cage. Turn to your neighbor on the right or the left, look them dead in their face and say, your fence will not be my cage. Turn to the other neighbor on the other side and say, your fence will never be my cage. 
pray with me and stay with me. Whew, woo, Lord. Every parent dream is that their children would do better at life, career, and contributions to the society. Our goal is that the next generation would progress further and experience things once denied to us. Things like freedom, respect, and a full expression of human dignity. Since our arrival in the Americas, persons of African descent have had to fight vehemently against the negative stereotypes of Africa as a backward continent and its descendants as backwards, lazy, and less intellectually capable than others. Do I have a witness? Such stereotypes, such stereotyping served as one of the underpinnings for apartheid in South America, in South, America South Africa. Slavery, Jim and Jane Crow segregation here in America, and redlining and a disparaged treatment by justice systems in Africa and in America. Despite these depictions of our people, we as a people rose up and have impacted America and the world in every area of society. And we are main contributors to why America became one of the greatest superpowers on earth. Do I have one witness up in here? But one could never measure the harm done for the psyche of Africans and African Americans who after being told in books and movies and in culture and all other arenas of life that we were substandard in all respects, having too many instances believed that propaganda and doubted the beauty and the greatness of their motherland, of our motherland and our people. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I believe there's still many of us who have low self-esteem and we doubt the beauty and greatness of our motherland and our people. We as a people had to fight for our dignity and personhood and freedom as human beings. And in 2017, we still have to fight. Many of us, though, have developed hatred and anger frustration and even build fences to keep the oppressor and the ugliness of society out but unbeknowingly we at the same time fenced in our children's potential and their destiny uh, and, and this is the case with two lead characters that I want to preach about today in your hearing one is in today's text in Judges chapter 11, uh, whose name is Jephthah, and the other is in that riveting movie called Fences, uh, whose name is Troy. Uh, Fences was a, a screen depiction of August Wilson's 1987 Tony Award winning play directed and starred in by Denzel Washington. Now, how many of you finally got, have seen the movie? I done preached about it for a couple of weeks. All y'all should get there. Y'all should get there. Stop waiting for it to come on Verizon and on television. Go see the movie. Mm -hmm. Jephthah, in the judge's text, was born in a house with several siblings who, upon their father's death, put him out of the family and the nation of Israel. Because his mother was different from the others, and his mama was a prostitute. And so they decided because his mother, although they had the same daddy, uh, although they had the, the same blood, uh, they, they uh, decided that uh, because his mama was a prostitute, they wanted to make sure he didn't inherit anything. He was rejected, abandoned, and he was the victim of a fence that was erected because of hatred prejudice and systemic marginalization yet despite this he became a great warrior in the streets with his cut buddies and crew yeah yeah he, he was a bad brother that uh jephthah had bad skills and and see the scripture says your gifts will make room for you <laughs> troy's gift never really made room for him to be in the majors uh to play baseball but jephthah's gift his his anointing to do war don't you know there's some brothers in the neighborhood that you gotta leave alone yeah. there's some people and some sisters too because there's some sisters that can throw down there's some sisters who can throw down and, and and some of us think we real hard until we run into the brother who's really hard 
that eat nails for dinner, that that's waiting for scratching to that to go around with you, who tangle and twist with you at any time. There's some people we need to leave alone. And Jephthah was such a bad warrior. Him and his cut buddies and crews, they had great exploits, and it was heard throughout the land. So when Israel were being beaten and attacked by the, Ammon, the, by the Ammonites, the enemy, the elders of the nation of Israel decided to call this bad black brother back home to be their captain, leader, and judge to fight against the evil empire of the Ammonites. Troy Maxson in the fence story, a fence story, uh, is similar to Jephthah because he too was hated, oppressed, and marginalized by his own people. In particular, when you see the movie, he had problems with his daddy, who he called the devil. Mm -hmm. uh, and after a brutal beating of his father, because uh, Troy stepped in, he tells the story, uh, to stop his daddy from raping a 13-year-old. And his father beat him so bad, he couldn't even open his eyes. His eyes were swollen so much, uh, and, and he had to leave his own father's house. And you see Troy... Played by Denzel Washington, despite his incredible athleticism, spiraled into prison, spiraled into pain and problems, all of which uh, uh, he fenced in his heart, which infected his family and his ability to progress in life. What I'm trying to say is if you ain't careful, parents, uh, you, what has gone on in your story that, that has broken your heart can infect your children if you don't put it in check. You see, when you watch the movie Fences, you begin to see that Troy was a professional baseball player, a star in the Negro Leagues, but it was Troy's bitter fate to come along a generation before Jackie Robinson. And so he never found fortune or fame from baseball, and he couldn't accept that the game is now opening up for others. I, 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 can, I compare him to like Charles Barkley. Uh, uh, Charles Barkley hates a lot of basketball players. He's, he hates on people too much. He, uh, anybody really succeeds. Because he's kind of mad with LeBron because LeBron is banking much money and he's going to be a billionaire soon. And so he keeps hating on LeBron. But did you saw what LeBron came back with? LeBron just spanked him publicly to let him know that, that he didn't, first of all, didn't have no champions. Second of all, uh, he, he was a bad example to children, and he, and he had a gambling problem. So LeBron got tired of a hater hating on, and he came back and slapped the hater back in his face. Mm -hmm. And so Troy in the movie is like that. Because he didn't make it, uh, he has this righteous uh, harem or uh, always going off on others who made it. He claims that he's better than all of them. And he could ball now. Uh, he, he was a bad baller, a bad hitter, a bad brother. But his gripe is rooted in an honest perception of a racist past. He was saying racism stopped me, not my gift. And he was right. But it was all rooted in the big-headed wrath of his own ego. And sometimes it's your ego that gets us in the way. Sometimes we get so full of ourselves, it blinds us to our true potential. And some people don't want to deal with you because your ego. You ever met somebody so full of themselves, uh, you don't need them no more? Because they done filled the room with their big ego, or should I say their big head? You see, Troy had some right points, but he was so full of himself and he was rooted in his own ego. Troy doesn't want anyone to enjoy the success he was denied. And that includes his own teenage son, Corey. Corey has an interview scheduled with a college football recruiter. He's at the doorway of opportunity, but his daddy, Troy, closes the door systematically as the white men in NASA try to shut the door to the hidden figures and the dynamic mathematician, Kathy Johnson, and all her sisters. When we stop progressing, there's always somebody trying to close your door. Uh, and I'm not talking about close your door like Teddy Pendergrass closed your door. I'm talking about haters shutting you out and shutting your gifts out. Not wanting you to succeed in all the things that God has put in you. Troy thinks that society will never change for black people. Especially for a black man. So he turns his belief. Somebody say belief. Into a self-fulfilling prophecy, and he builds an invisible fence that he's trying to barricade his son Corey in. 
Mm -hmm. I I'm trying to help somebody today because a lot of things that we have in our lives can build invisible fences, uh, starts the invisibility of our mind and our thought lives. And, and we parents, we want the best for our children, but sometimes we're the very thing that's holding them back. We, we want to elevate them, but we find that we, we, we are more scared and fearful. And so we deposit fearfulness and scared uh, into our children. And so they're paralyzed by fear and can't produce because you're scared. You want them to be scared. Oh, uh, Troy, Troy, but Troy's redemption is possible because he never had illusions to begin with. What helps poor uh, Troy is that he has rigid ideas about work. He has a work ethic. He has a responsibility uh, and manhood that constitute not to, not to a demand for attention, but an assertion of dignity. His cruelty, though, he did project in his fatherhood dignity and told his son to say, yes, sir, when you come in, uh, to respect my household. He was right, and that's why I believe Corey ended up later on in the military, because he had a military-type daddy in his home. Anybody grew up with a military-type daddy in your home? Uh, see, see, when I was a kid, my father, who was a paratrooper, uh, did everything like a military. Uh, all five of his kids, me being the youngest, we had to walk in line to the dinner table. Walk in line. We had to square around the table. Then we had to sidestep in front of our food. I'm talking about four-year-olds. Look at our hands to make sure they were clean. Then he would say, sit. We would sit. And see, he had all that regimen, and he made us like military robots, but he didn't know how to love us. He didn't know how to, the discipline of love. And so too many fathers uh, want their sons to be disciplined like soldiers, but they don't touch them and love them and speak life to them and encourage them. Uh, yes, you're raising up men, but compassion and love creates greatness. Oh, I'm trying to help somebody today. I'm trying to help somebody. Troy had cruelty. And we later on in the movie see selfishness and short-sightedness and they're all inseparable from his loyalty, steadfastness, and existential courage. He had a dichotomy. He was two people in one body. Thank God for his woman, Rose. Rose knows all about her man. And she helps us in the, in the audience to see it. Uh, she, she shows us this uh, power uh, to foil and help her helpmate. Uh, her, her relative uh, resonance makes her not just the film's conscious, but it's the central mystery. Why Rose keep helping her man? Because it falls on Rose to solve the problems her own husband created. To smooth over relationships with his sons and her, his brother Gabriel, a brain-damaged veteran. Rose could not spare her son from the wrath of her husband's pain, his own self-hate, and anger at his shattered dreams. His fence was built in his mind so much, uh, he had haterade in his life for his own self. Can I go a little bit deeper? Say, go deeper, Pastor. Uh, when you enter two, these two stories uh, and pull the treasure from challenging uh, our parents, if you take these two stories and use them as a treasure to empower our parents and empower the youth to allow God-inspired directions through their parents to elevate their lives to the next level. We want our young people to go to the next level. And, and, and so I want to give you... I want to give you the same two main points from the narratives of the judge's text and the movie that can help parents make new decisions that can impact our children's future uh, from this judge's text and the, the fences movie. You ready to write these down? I'm going to give it to you. Write them down. Look inside your program. The other side of the announcements is your note sheet. Two points. I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to preach them a whole different way. Get, hold on, hold on. Number one. Don't let your hasty decisions of your present, which are driven by your past, kill your child's future. Can I say it again? Don't let your hasty decisions of your present, which are driven by the pain of your past, kill your child's future. Everybody want to say it one more time? Don't let your hasty decisions... And all you single folk that don't have children, write it down because you're going to need this. Your day is coming. Don't let your hasty decisions of your present, which are driven by your pain of your past, to kill your child's future. And number two, don't decide to build negative fences 
for your children. Don't decide to build negative fences for your children using the lumber of your pain, the nails of your problems, and the unhealthy promises or vows you made. I'm going to say it one more time. Don't decide to build fences, negative fences, for your children using the lumber of your pain, the nails of your problem, and the unhealthy promises or vows you made. Can I attack this real quick? Y'all stay with me and pray with me. Amen. Troy, the first point, don't let your hasty decisions of your present, which are driven by your past, kill your children's future. Troy and his wife Rose had a teenage son named Corey who had athletic skills like his daddy. His father who never got a chance to fulfill his dreams of playing in the majors because of racism and prejudice and eventually old age. Uh, Troy constantly rants about his abilities and put down present players and the entire athletic system. Troy is disgusted with the entire system and promised himself that he would never let the same system that shattered his dreams shatter his own son's dreams. But it did. Troy built a fence uh, in anger and frustration and negativity and hatred. A hatred for his own dad and a hatred for a racist society like America. Uh, Rose always wanted him to build the fence in the backyard, but if you watch the movie, he never gets to build it. And the reason he never gets to build it is that he has so much fences being erected in his own head, he don't have the time to build a physical fence to protect his own household. Uh, you see, uh, his fence is in his mind, and the fence restricted his production, minimized his creativity, and paralyzed his dreams. Troy tried to keep everyone that had a dream in his fence. Have you ever met somebody who's trying to fence you in from your purpose? Have you met somebody, even on your job, who, who's jealous of you for reasons you don't even know about, trying to stop your blessings, trying to block you from your destiny, trying to hinder you? Uh, yeah, Troy, uh, he has his own fence, uh, and he's trying to keep everyone and their dreams and his own friends, but his son, Corey, wanted to break out. And I'm here to tell you, uh, we have a different generation today, and, and they're breaking out. They're using technology to break out. And see, technology gave them a tool that most parents can't keep up with today. And so God will give tools to young people for them to dream another dream. They can do things uh, that we couldn't do before, just like our Hebony can do now. She can, from her home, uh, she can do everything a studio used to be able to do. She don't need Motown. She can write her own song, do her own music, distribute it her own stuff, and send it around the world through social media. Uh, there's a different time. So I want to tell parents, instead of stopping their kids uh, from doing what they need to do and what they're called to do, empower them and teach them. Teach them the discipline they need to do it with integrity and with character and with godliness and don't be a fool and represent your family or Christ out in the world. Right? We, we got a lot of people who are fools. And we got a president that's a fool. That's too, yeah. But we got, we got a lot of people that's a fool. And, but we have to make sure, as our ancestors did in the days of old, when they sent us out, they said we go with dignity. We don't wear our pants on the ground. We don't act a fool in the streets. We go with dignity because we represent our race, our God, and our people and our family. We got to do it with dignity. Somebody say, do it with dignity. Do it, do it with dignity. Do you, do you, do everything that God called you to do. Do it you, but do it with dignity. Oh, I'm preaching, but nobody's helping me right here. Troy, 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 try to keep everybody out. Troy's decision regarding possible hope for tomorrow made him feel strangled. It made him stuck for 18 years in the same place. Troy let his past drive his present and it attempted to kill his own son Corey's future. How many parents let their past control their present and cut off their own children's future? Too many parent, parents are battling demons from their past that are manifesting themselves in the present and strangling their child's future. 
our addictions, our, our bad relationships, our bed partners, our marriages, our unseemly friends, our arrest records, our criminal activity, our failure to study, our giving up too soon, our dropping out of school, on and on and on like hot butter on popcorn. Decisions, decisions, decisions we made in the past can blot out so much potential of our children in the future. But I want you to know this blood that's been shed that can change everything around. God gives us power to break strongholds of our past. We don't have to settle and allow any demon from our past to dictate our children's future. We got to tell the devil, hell no. Tell him, hell no, no, no. You are not going to have my children. Yes, I fell down, but I got back up. Yes, I fell and I made some mistake, but I'm be doing better now. Yes, I did some things that I'm not uh, proud of, but thank God, grace and mercy met me at the door and got me along my way. Anybody glad about grace and mercy? Grace got me out of the jailhouse. Grace gave me another chance. Grace cured me of my addiction. Grace did it. Grace did it. Somebody say grace did it. Grace did it. Grace did it. Grace did it. Decisions we made in the past don't have to blot out the potential of the future. So in the movie, there's a, a lot of keys. If we study the movie, I hopefully we'll get a small group. There's a lot of sneaky things that August Wilson put in there are coded. I'm going to break a couple of them down for you. Uh, Troy, older son. Lions, his name was. Not from Empire, y'all. Lion, the older son, is from a previous relationship. Lion is laid back. He's an easygoing musician who wants more out of life than working every day like his daddy working a job of grudgery and drudgery like his father and he's always in need of money every time he came over he wanted some money ten dollars dad dad you got ten dollars dad dad can i borrow another money he waits for payday to show up but august wilson as he's writing that he's writing his older sons as a as a reminder and metaphor of his own self Mm -hmm. uh, his inability to break through uh, in his youth and in his life so his old son is walking around always in need and is a reminder to Troy himself that he was broken and that, uh, that he couldn't get it together and so sometimes there are people in our life that God allowed to be there to remind you what not to be yeah, yeah. You, 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 there's a lot of people I grew up with rem, was reminding me to go to school. My, my boys, when I was in the gang called the Lords, uh, 13, 14, carrying a gun, hanging out with them. But I was making my little behind get to get to school because I wanted to be an A student and I wanted to get out of the projects. And they would say, why are you going to school? I said, I got to go to school because my mama needs milk. My mama needs a better place to, to get a home. I'm not going to let my mama stay in this ghetto. And as soon as at 26 years old, I brought my my mama a house and moved her out of the projects and I put her in a new place because I didn't let the people I was hanging with determine who's in my future I refused to lay down yes I was in the streets but I made my mind up somebody say make up your daggone mind make up your daggone mind pastor's preaching today but y'all not feeling it as good as I wanted you to make up your mind you see Corey wants to win his father over every son in particular but every child really wants to win their father over but troy just want him to work there was a part in the movie that was so riveting and capturing rose comes to troy speaking of corey she says troy he just want to be like you with sports troy says i don't want him to be like me I want him to get as far from my life as he possibly can get. Rose, you are the only decent thing that ever happened to me. Can you see how Troy has made a decision that his life is worth nothing and he's driving his son away just like his father drove him away? What I'm trying to say is because he was driven away, beat up by his father, he's beating up his son. He's not putting his hands, although they did get in a, a match and he knocked his son down to remind him that he ain't the baddest wolf in this cat. And sometimes we do daddies have to sometimes, because boys kind of get up feeling themselves at a certain age. 
All the brothers remember that, how you start feeling yourself. You feel a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah. I, my son did that same thing. He rose up. He can't get a little bit bigger than me. He's he going to now take me on. Now He, he said, yeah, let's get, put the gloves on and box. And he commenced to hit me so hard. I was like, woo. What the are you? And I said, oh, you, you got to. Yeah, Mo. Oh, yeah, Mo. He, he, bang, he banging me. Boom, boom. He's like, get me back for anything I ever did to him. And I just shouted, woo. Knocked him down, out. He was laying on. He was out. And I'm trying to tell him, I'm the Lion King here. I'm the, I'm the Lion King here. I'm the Lion. It helped Maurice. It helped him to understand that he can't just roll up on any crazy Negro from the street. It helped him to understand there's an order to the household. Respect your daddy. Respect the family. And too many of our family and our young people don't respect the household don't respect mama and don't respect grandma and, and y'all think it's cute it's not cute when our kids are calling you out of your name it's not cute when they refuse to listen to you it's not cute when they doing what they want to do anytime they want to do it and nobody's stopping them it's not cute when they acting a fool and you letting them act a fool stop letting them do anything they want you're the parent what do you mean they don't want to come to church what do you mean I, I, I left my kids home? You dragged them to church like you got drugged to church. As long as you in my house, we're going to serve. Oh, I'm preaching now. Oh. Mm, 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 mm. Call y'all sit down, sit down, sit down. I want to keep going. I want to hurry up. Troy is a, making his son hate him. He doesn't want his son, listen y'all, to be like him. Mm, my God. His son in the movie says, why, daddy, why don't you like me? That's, that, that was the most painful part of the movie for me. It reminded me how I felt about my own dad, who I thought was crazy, who couldn't stand me for, from whipping and beating me as a three and four year old. And how I trained for 18 years to take his life. Went through martial arts training, learning every form of martial arts that I could, weapon every training and everything, to come kill my dad for beating my mama and putting his hands on me as a kid. I planned my father's death, and if it wasn't for my mother stopping me as I go to Howard University, he wouldn't be dead right now. I'm trying to tell you, there is pain, especially boys, but girls too, got inside of them about the pain and we need to get inside that pain and deliver them and set them free so they can soar like eagles in the sky. <sighs> Troy let his bad relationship with his father, well let me just say something, any of you who got great fathers and mothers, you ought to thank God. If they already passed on to the other side, you still bless them while they're on the other side. But if they are alive, call them up and say, I love you and thank you for being a good parent because you didn't have to be. Anybody just want to say, thank you, God. Yes. Through it all, you got me through, through it all. But Troy, he led his bad relationship with his father. His bad prison experience, his bad encounters with society and racism erode his relationship with his own son. His la he let his past affect and effect his present and the poison of it infected his son's future and his hope for tomorrow. So it was with Jephthah in the text. Jephthah came up in the school of hard knocks well, as well. He was marginalized and judged by society, by those who should have loved him. Unlike Troy, his gift made room for him. He was a warrior, a great warrior, yet he, had, he can fight, but he had bad judgment uh, that came from a need for acceptance and love. And oftentimes, because we have broken places in our lives, uh, we, we've been abandoned and rejected, uh, we, want, we, we will accept any kind of love we can get. That's why young ladies, you get into a relationship with boys who don't care for you because you're looking for daddy's love. That's why a lot of boys get in relationship with girls and never get satisfied because they're trying to find acceptance for someone to finally really love them the right way. And God really wanted all of us to be loved the right way. But unfortunately, it didn't happen for all of us. But I want you to know there's a father in heaven. 
an Abba Daddy who keep you covered, who love you and never leave you or forsake you. But you and I and all of us, in our particular in our community, is have to confront the demons and not let the demons of our past take our sons and our daughters of today. Anybody ready to fight for your children? It's a fight. It's a fight. It's not an easy fight. It's a fight. Fight for your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. But you and I got to go back into our own history and ask ourselves the question, am I healed from my past? Let's say it together. Am I healed from my past? And if you're not, start getting some healing. Because it is going to seep into your children's life. Ooh, I'm trying to help somebody. I'm trying to help them. Ooh, I felt something in the spirit realm. Oh, my God. <laughs> Families in the nation went back to Jephthah because they knew he was from the hood and he can throw down. They now go recruit the very person they didn't want now. That judges text is about all the boys and girls that in the hood where people only want you when, you, when they can use you. Uh, yeah, but see, J J Jephthah was no fool. He, he was a negotiator. He, he must have had some contracting in his background because he, he, he was a negotiator. Uh, he, they came and got him. They said, uh, we need you to lead uh, us. And he, uh, if you read the text correctly, Jephthah sought the Lord. Y'all going to miss it. He's from the hood. He's from the wrong side of the tracks. But he sought the Lord. You see, you don't got to be in church to seek the Lord. Some of the greatest giants were never in the church. But they had a personal relationship with God. And they knew how to bend their knees and seek God's will for their life. And I don't know about you, but I, I want to be the church, not just be in the church. I want to be able to go through the streets and navigate the hell that's out there, but still be the church. I can bow down anywhere. I can bow down on the train or on the bus. I can bow down even in a crack house and turn it into a black house. I can bow down anywhere. If you would just bow down and let God God do a work in you no matter where you come from don't listen to the people say you from Baltimore yeah I'm from Baltimore but I'm a praying Baltimore Negro yeah, you from North, East, and South East. Yes, and I'm proud of it because I can bow my knees and I got a God who's in the East, in the West, in the North, and in the South. Is there anybody hearing me to preach today? Oh, look at him. He, brought, he bowed his knees because the power to defeat the Ammonites uh, was right there in God. But then he got caught up in the, I call it the high or the euphoria of it all. And he made a hasty and stupid decision. And what made it crazy is that as he's all in God, he's in the presence of God, you would think he would stay in the presence. But he got carnal while being in the presence. Ooh, Lord Jesus. And he decided to say, because you, you bring deliverance, God, the first thing that came out of my door, we're going to present it as a burnt offering. Why would you do something like that? Knowing your daughter live in the house. But sometimes we get high on Jesus and stupid on the earth. So I want you to understand, many times you're high on Jesus in your own mind. Because you can't be really touching the heart of God and do foolish things. And sometimes when we get into our praise moment, we're really looking around to see who's looking at us. We're really looking around to see who's giving us glory. And when you get that carnal, when you're in the presence of God, you're going to make some stupid decisions. You're going to mess it up. Somebody say, you're going to mess it up. You're going you to mess it up. He, he, he says to God, if you deliver the people of Amnon in my hands, whatever comes out of my doors to meet me when I return in peace, to meet me coming out my door, I will give it as a burnt offering. To Jephthah's amazement, the first thing that came out of the door was his only daughter. My God, I, I, I got to move on because I, I could preach this all day and I don't want y'all to stay here all day. Y'all want y'all to leave and go do your thing. First lady's out of town and I'm missing her right now, so I got an attitude. Excuse me. <laughs> she down there with my granddaughter and Maurice and I'm mad I'm not there with them. 
but I'm going to preach this in honor of her being gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so his, his only child and daughter, but the text shows us later on that they, she takes all her friends, all her girlfriends, all their makeup and all their stuff, and they go up to the town, tell daddy, don't call me, don't, don't Facebook me, don't Instagram me, don't Snapchat me, don't mess with me. I'm going up to the mountains to cry. She didn't want to cry around the parents. She went up to the mountain with her girlfriends from the neighborhood and to cry and she accepted what daddy did as a vow. She said, I submit to your will to what you promised God because you gave your word to God. I will give my life. But first, I got to go cry. I, I don't know why uh, God's leading me this way, but I believe there's still too many children going to cry. <laughs> they go into mountains and they go into the locker rooms uh, uh, in, the, in their schools and they go into places, but they're not showing you parents that they really are hurt so mad. They're crying. They're, they're crying about pain uh, that you didn't even know they had inside of them. And now some of us are adults and we're still crying. We're going to places to weep because we can't weep publicly because we don't want to let nobody know that we're in pain. But I'm trying to tell you, Jesus wept. And if Jesus can weep, you better weep, girl. You better weep, boy. Get it on out of you. Weeping will heal you. Weeping will soothe you. Weeping will deliver you. Weeping will break some yokes off of you. Weeping will open your eyes. Weeping up. And they went up there to cry, cry. She cried. She said, I'm now, uh, I'm untouched from a man. I'm unmarried. And now I'm feeling kind of unloved by daddy. But daddy gave his word and I'm going to keep my word. I like that part of the text. Because there's too many too faithful people in the world who won't keep their word. We got one right in the White House. He says one thing, does another. He refuses to keep his word. And our young people think it's alternative facts. Don't you teach our babies about no alternative facts as being truth. Truth is truth. And the truth will set you free. Oh, okay. Leave it alone. There are decisions, I'm trying to say, we make that hurt our, our children as adults. We can hurt, hurt their future. There are some adults here now who understand some decisions were made when you were a child that's affecting you even today. But now I want to talk about, secondly, don't decide to build fences for your children using the lumber of your pain, the nails of your problem, and the unhealthy promises that I'm going to get out your way. See, by the end of the movie Fences, we learn a lot about Troy Maxson. We learn about his hard southern childhood, his time in prison, about being in the Negro Leagues, his work ethics, his sexual appetites, and his parenting philosophy. But the first and most important thing, pay attention here, we know about this man is that he is one of the greatest talkers. Somebody say great talker. He enters the screen on a tide of verbiage. Denzel lays it out. He's constantly talking, running his mouth dexterity in his verbal capacity, joring with his friend Bono uh, and bantering with his wife Rose. When you, in the movie, the audience quickly grasps what Rose and Bono have known for years. Troy is, by turn, very funny, very provocative, inspiring, and hurtful all at the same time. And by one thing he will never be as long as he draws breath is silent. Mm -hmm. Troy will never be silent. There are times we cover our pain problems and our healthy promises with a lot of talk and no action. There are a lot of people who specialize in just talking about what they're going to do year after year after year after year, but I ain't doing nothing. Because you let the talking become your reality. You built it so, you talked about it so much, it feels real. Oh, I'm preaching by myself today. Mm -hmm. and also, and, but we throw a lot of words around, listen, trying to mask the hurt and the hatred. And we're really building fences that restrict our children's growth, greatness, and gifts with the lumber of our pain, the nails of our unending problems, and the unhealthy vows we make ourselves out. See, there's a lot of code. Can I give you the code of the movie? Their names. Troy, Corey. Father Troy, son Corey. Both of their names has R-O-Y in it. Y'all going to be in a minute. Mm -hmm. Troy, his name means foot soldier, similar to the city of Troy that was warring in the Greco time. And Cory means seething pool. 
Mm. At least in the Scots, it means. Cory has money means seething pool in the Scottish and hollow in Irish, but chosen in English and horn in French. See, both of them have hope built into their names. See, Troy, T. Roy, mm -hmm, T is the cross, mm -hmm, representing a crucified life, that he's going to be crucified through his life. C represent a conforming to Christ. And they both got Ori or O-R-Y in it, right? Are you still, you're, you're still, you're still with me? So both of them, Lee, you got this? Has an O-R-Y in him or a R-O-Y. There's no name in Greek or Latin for O-R-Y, uh, but the letter R-O-Y is the letter built Roy means red. In Latin, regis or rexidon means name is a presides over regal or royal clothing. Mm -hmm, mm. Uh, but in the French, uh, it means king. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so what I'm trying to say is the name Troy indeed was crucified by society, racism and hate. It made him mad, so mad he became such a soldier against the fight for, for, for our rights all through the play. But Corey was seething from all the stuff his daddy was depositing him, but there's something in him that got the blood uh, that is red, uh, Lord have mercy, that it helps him to be able to not go become like his daddy because there's a king inside both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You see, uh, you could have named him uh, Troy Jr., but, but August Wilson was making sure we understand that names matter, uh, that, that we got to make sure how we name our kids because sometimes we can name them to the pain, like j Baz, which means pain. Be careful how you name your kids, but I want you to know there's a name uh, that's given to every saint of God, a new name written down in glory. It's a name that comes out of the cross and the shed red blood of Jesus Christ. It helps you and me conform like Corey to the image of God and become a king. Every child has a king in them, but when they get saved, they get a king of kings in them. Anybody here glad they got a king of kings in them? See, see, it's one thing to have a king with a little K in you, but it's another when the king of kings starts to live in you. And so the movie is trying to tell us daddy had to be crucified so the king could live. <laughs> okay, y'all, y'all, y'all just did. Y'all just let that pass. Okay, I'll leave it. I'll give you another way to handle this. Mm -hmm. Deal with the fence we build in ourselves, right? Many still rise despite the blockades, the barricades, and the fences to build a life. If you remember through the scripture, we got examples of fathers who came through but still built. Moses was cast in the sea to become the general of the first protest march from slavery to freedom. Isaiah said, woe is me, there's no good in me, but became God's prophet who lips were touched by the burning coals of incense from the altar and said, send me. Amos was the man of God but had problems with his daddy, but was God agent for justice. Solomon, mommy, and daddy, Bathsheba, and Davis fell to the lust of it all, but Solomon was great God's repository of love and wisdom. Ezekiel was tripping many times, but he became God's preacher in a cemetery to prove that bones could still live. Job lost everything, became the enemy uh, because of the enemy sought to have Job. But Job became God's example of a man who preserved in spite of the predicament and the pain. Nehemiah was God's builder when the walls of Jerusalem had fallen down and the gates had burned in fire. Paul was a murderer of the saints but became God's molder of the missionary movements. I'm trying to let you know one man sinned, Adam, caused the fall all from hell, death, and the grave. But one man, obedience, Jesus Christ, who was crucified, buried, he got up with all power in his hand so that I can get up. What I'm trying to say, there's bad decisions all in the Bible and they are good decisions. Uh, don't you remember Noah got drunk as a parent, naked, and his son looked on him and had Ham uh, and, and Canaan were cursed. Adam and Eve uh, were, were ate the forbidden fruit and sin entered the world. Uh, and, and, and leading Abel to, marry, uh, to murder his son, uh, his brother Cain. Abraham's wife Sarah got impatient with God and allowed her husband to sleep with her handmaid in Hagar and birthed Ishmael. Ishmael and we still fighting against Israel and all the Palestinians and all together today. David took back Sheba from his husband Uriah, had a child. My God. And then her son, his son Absalom rose up to take the territory. All throughout the Bible, we see bad decisions infecting and affecting children. But I want to close with a good decision. A parent that looked high and looked low. A parent 
that decided that you were worth so much more than anybody could ever know. It's a parent that wanted you to know that we have a rich heritage, a heritage that's better than any heritage you can ever get from anybody else. Yes, we got black heritage, but it ain't even about black. It's not about white. It's not about brown or green. There's a heritage that, that goes beyond all heritage. But it's because a son made a decision. Jesus made a decision that would change all our lives. Jesus decided to put down the vestments of glory and his royal diadem. Jesus decided to come down 40 and two generations. Jesus decided to take the flesh of man and to live in this earthly tabernacle. Jesus decided to walk the earth to heal the sick and raise the dead. I'm trying to tell you about a good decision. Jesus decided to carry the cross with your name on it and with my name on it. Jesus decided to give seven last words to give us seven opportunities to get healed. Jesus decided to die on Golgotha's hill and to go in a tomb. Uh, Jesus decided to stay there all day Friday, to stay there all day Saturday. And Jesus decided on Sunday morning, hey, 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 to get up with all power in his hands. And because Jesus decided to, uh, I don't have to think about all my bad decisions that affected my children. I don't have to stay guilty about my mistakes that I made. Uh, because Jesus decided uh, he makes a way out of no way. Uh, he makes a way of his... He makes a way of... He makes a way of escape for every one of the believers so before you leave out of here this morning uh, or this afternoon remember for everything the enemy has set up to you to blockade you to barricade you to fence you in Jesus has made a way of escape you can live free you can be what you gotta be you don't have to be down and out you can be free go through the door that God has opened for you go get the opportunities that God has made for you he's provided a way out of escape for you and for me father I thank you because I was just thinking about my mistakes as a daddy things I didn't really do really right but I tried the best I can to raise up godly children in an ungodly world and today there's so many parents who's doing their best some of us are carrying forth some of the dysfunction and pain of our past, trying to give our kids a better future. Some of us are weary of well-doing. But I'm glad that the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary is sufficient to blot out daddy mistakes, mama mistakes, and children mistakes. If we just invest in Christ, who's the only answer for the world, God, I pray that this people called East Friendship and all the households represented here today will not allow their past to block their destiny. It doesn't matter how old or what age you are. While you're still on this side, God is saying, I still have work for you to do. Don't lay down to I lay you down. But go forth, touch the next generation, and love these kids into their destiny of greatness. Thank you, Jesus, for second and third, fifth and tenth and twenty-ninth opportunities to get it right. Now, God, take us all to the next level that we can be more like you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Let everybody standing to their feet say amen. If you're in here...